everyone, I'm Kim Brimmer, your host today for another edition of Boba News, keeping you up to date on the cattle industry's latest in technology, management, genetics, and more. The weeks leading up to, during, and after calving put beef cows under the most stress they'll see all year. And right now we're in the middle of calving season for most beef operations. Getting cows through this period and onto a successful breeding season is critical for the near and long-term future of your beef herd. Joining us today are two experts who will provide insights into how to get cows through this stressful period. They're Dr. Justin Reinhardt from the University of Missouri and Dr. Eric Bailey from the University of Tennessee. Our first presenter is Dr. Justin Reinhardt, who is an extension beef cattle specialist at the Institute of Agriculture within the University of Tennessee. He provides research-based management tools and technologies that help beef cattle producers improve the reproductive efficiency of their cow herds. Justin also delivers training and updates to UT extension agents that help them prepare for troubleshooting, educating, and consulting with the beef cattle producers in their communities. Along with these responsibilities, he communicates concerns and issues from beef cattle producers across the state to keep the UT research faculty informed about information that's needed but has not yet been addressed or basic or applied research, and then participate in the translation of new research findings for field trials and demonstrations. Justin also coordinates the Tennessee Beef Heifer Development Reproductive Management Training Programs and provides reproductive management curriculum for the Tennessee Master Beef Producer Program. Welcome, Justin. Thank you, Kim, and I'm delighted to be here today to talk about uh, basically managing cows to be able to get them to rebreed uh, when we need them to uh, after the um, previous uh, breeding season. And there are a lot of things that go into this, so I just want to start by uh, talking about what we need to understand uh, about the cow, about her physiology, about her endocrinology, um, what we need to know to, to be able to make uh, really sound management decisions and to understand how the nutritional effects that Eric will talk about uh, impact reproductive performance. So to do that, I'll need to get a little bit sciencey here as we start, but just uh, bear with me for a moment and we'll get into some uh, production and management topics after we cover that. But it, it all uh, flows into to having a better understanding of exactly what we're managing so we know why we make the management decisions we do. So the first thing to understand about the uh, the reproductive performance uh, of a, a cow or a heifer uh, is that uh, really what happens in her reproductive tract, so in her uterus and her ovaries, is actually controlled through hormones that are produced uh, actually in her brain and in a little area at the base of her brain and a, and a little gland right under the brain. So the hypothalamus uh, there um, at the base of the brain produces uh, hormones that, that go to the pituitary that produces another set of hormones uh, that get out into the cow's circulation, end up back at the reproductive tract at the ovaries, and those are what actually stimulate uh, the development of follicles. And, and if, you're, um, if you've had some discussion about uh, reproductive performance and know that each of those follicles uh, have uh, an oocyte, or we'll call that an egg usually, uh, each of those has an egg in it. And whenever that cow comes into heat, it, she releases that egg. And hopefully we have sperm cells either delivered by the bull or through artificial insemination, uh, those are there waiting on that egg in the appropriate place in the reproductive tract. Um, so again, it's very important to understand that uh, what we're trying to manage is not just in the reproductive tract of the cow. Uh, what we're trying to manage is actually the entire cow as a system herself and within a system as well. Uh, we're trying to manage those things to work properly and for her, um, her brain and the pituitary uh, to communicate properly with her uh, reproductive tract, specifically with their ovaries, and, and to control what's going on there throughout the estrus cycle. So understanding that, uh, again, will help us understand the management uh, a bit better. And so as we boil down into that, uh, that you know, that's what I just described is the way the system works uh, when it's functioning properly. Um, or I should say whenever a cow is having or a heifer is having normal estrus cycles. But there are these periods of time uh, where a cow or a heifer does not have a, uh, have it, normal estrus cycles, those 21-day interval uh, estrus cycles like we think of. And those are called, we, we refer to those as periods of anestrus. And um, there can be pre-pubertal anestrus. So when a heifer, before she reaches puberty, of course, she's not having those normal estrus cycles. And uh, after a cow has a calf and until... Uh, everything is back in order um, to, to work properly. Uh, she won't have uh, normal estrus cycles uh, for that uh, that anestrus period. 
or that uh, postpartum interval. Um, we, we have a lot of terms around this that, that all kind of start to blend together. But for this, what we're discussing here today, uh, just to understand that there's a period of time from when a cow has that calf until she starts those normal estrus cycles. And that's what we have here uh, on this slide is, is looking at uh, what's happening both on the ovaries uh, and uh, specifically with the hormone progesterone. Now, I haven't mentioned uh, that just yet, um, but if you think about that, uh, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, how they communicate with the ovaries, as we get a little more specific on the ovaries, whenever one of those follicles uh, ruptures and when it ovulates and releases an egg, then that tissue that used to be the follicle then turns into a corpus luteum. And um, where the follicle was producing estrogen, uh, a steroid hormone, uh, before it ovulated, and that's what actually triggers ovulation because it goes back to the hypothalamus and to some degree the pituitary to communicate with them in that whole feedback loop. Uh, so it switches from producing that estrogen to progesterone. And progesterone gets its name uh, from uh, what it does. It's progestational hormone. Uh, so progesterone needs to be in the cow's system uh, to maintain a pregnancy. Uh, and it's also in her system uh, between the periods of times when she has these uh, estrous uh, events or she's in standing heat uh, and, and ovulating. So it controls a lot of things. And again, uh, you don't have to remember all the specifics of, of the way those hormones communicate, uh, but just remember that there is a communication from the brain, the gland in the base of the brain between the, the reproductive tract and the ovaries and then the hormones that the ovaries produce, uh, more specifically the follicle and the CL on the ovaries produced, they go back to the hypothalamus and the pituitary and set up this, this feedback kind of a loop, uh, this type of communication. All right, so back to what we're actually managing this anesthesia period. Um, and, and so it shows here kind of graphed out on this slide uh, with day zero being the day that a cow has a calf. Now there's a, um, a period of time there where the, the uterus um, is not actually functioning correctly or it needs to repair itself. It goes from carrying a, a 60 or 70 pound calf uh, and a lot of fluid and a lot of membranes. It, it has that calf, so all that uh, leaves the, the uterus and it has to kind of shrink back to, to its normal uh, functioning size when it's not pregnant. Um, has to repair if there was any damage that was done during the calving event. Uh, so we call that uterine involution. Now, the thing to understand here to, to realize, it doesn't actually take as long as you might think. In a couple of weeks, uh, you know, if it was uh, everything worked like it should uh, during that calving event, it only takes a couple of weeks for that uterus to, to be back uh, to, to being functional if it needed to be. But the cow has built into her system uh, a trigger that says, okay, uh, basically tells her from what she sees in her environment, I don't need to um, be having normal estrous cycles and, and be able to get pregnant again too quickly because I need to support this lactation of the calf I just had uh, and gain some uh, some body condition back like Eric will talk about. Uh, and I need to, to get all that done before I actually am ready to, to, get, um, to, to be fertile again uh, because if I did those too close together, uh, then uh, that cow wouldn't be able to, to support herself uh, with um, a normal environment. At least that's the way it, uh, it, it was originally um, developed to, to, uh, to operate. So after the, that uh, um, couple of weeks of uterine evolution and the cow still needs to, to go through a period of time where she's not fertile, uh, the rest of that anesthesis is, is really uh, a function of those hormones not uh, working correctly that I just described. Or, uh, that it's correct, but uh, not working in the normal way uh, whenever the, the cow is having normal estrous cycles. So she'll um, grow a follicle during that time. Uh, you know, she'll start growing a group of follicles. One might get big enough to ovulate, but again, it's, it's not time yet for all that stuff to, to start happening again. She doesn't need to get uh, pregnant again that quickly. It's what the environment's telling her. Uh, so that follicle dies off. It lets uh, another group and another follicle develop to uh, become uh, big enough to ovulate and, and release an egg. But again, she's just not ready yet. Um, but eventually, as that cow's getting the cues from her environment, to, and specifically, uh, a lot of it deals with nutrition um, and, and the perception of, we'll call it energy, uh, for kind of a gross terminology, uh, that her brain it, it just, it's not telling her, perceiving uh, that her environment's ready for her to get uh, pregnant again. Uh, but again, as she gets closer to that, now everything's right, uh, then she'll go ahead and ovulate a follicle. 
uh, and release an egg and uh, she could get pregnant and that's going to become important. I'll mention really briefly in just a little bit uh, that, that she could can become pregnant to this first ovulation. But the, the nuance here is that she doesn't actually show behavioral ester. She doesn't have standing heat when she has that first uh, ovulation. So we call that a silent heat. The, the real importance of this is that that follicle, when it um, ovulates, when she drops that, that egg, uh, that follicle does turn into a CL and produces progesterone. That doesn't quite produce as much or for uh, as a uh, long a duration as it normally would in a normal ester cycle. So it's only there for about seven to 10 days, producing a little bit lower amount of progesterone. But the, and we call that a short cycle. The importance of that short cycle though is that it primes that system to start back. So it went through 282 days plus or minus of just seeing progesterone in that system. Uh, transition after she had that calf into this anestrous period where uh, she needs to, to wait a little bit to be fertile again. Uh, but then whenever the environment says, okay, it's time, she needs to, to, to show her hypothalamus and her pituitary uh, a little bit of this exposure to progesterone to reset that, that feedback loop, to reset that timing and the mechanism that, that uh, by which the, uh, the brain, the pituitary, and, and uh, control the ovaries and the, the other hormones associated with it. So just remember that that short cycle is extremely important. And that uh, tells us more about why we um, uh, have uh, the management protocols that we do. So with that understanding, let's move forward and talk about some uh, some ways to manage this postpartum anestrus with the idea in mind that uh, every um, if we want a cow to have a calf at about the same time every year, we only have about 80 or 85 days for all that to happen that I just talked about. Now, a lot of those moving parts need to come together and sync back up. Uh, and just, uh, you know, before hopefully 80 or 85 days are up so we can have that cow calving in that same calving season again the next uh, the next year. So that's really what we're managing. Uh, and there are so many things that, that impact that, uh, whether or not she had a difficult time calving. Uh, Eric's going to talk to you a lot about nutrition and body condition score, how that influences the age of the cow. If it's a first calf effort, um, we'll need to pay attention to them a little more closely. Um, and, and a lot of these other things, genetics and health, uh, they, they all impact that uh, the the duration of that postpartum anestrus. So that by saying that, it means that they all impact our success at getting that cow bred in the next breeding season uh, when we want to. Real quickly, Eric will talk more about this, but uh, I think of uh, nutrition as kind of a water tank. You know, they, we basically need to give them enough to, to maintain their basic life functions, to add body condition, uh, and then to after that, when they, you know, through nutrition, uh, nutrient partitioning, uh, the, the last thing that they'll support if they're not already pregnant are estrous cycles and being fertile. Uh, so that's just kind of helps me frame the, that discussion uh, that we're trying to fill that tank up to a certain point to, to make sure that, that those cows have the opportunity uh, to get rebred quickly the next time. So the thing that to me is the single most important management uh, factor, we'll say, uh, in cow-calf production, whether it's seed stock or commercial, uh, is um, it, it, I relate it or make an analogy with row crop production. So I, I show this field of corn. What does that have to do with cattle production? Um, if we apply the same concept of uh, planting an entire uh, field of corn, uh, doing our um, fertilization, uh, herbicides, uh, insecticides, all that can be done on the entire field at the exact same time. Uh, and it can all be harvested at the same time and we can market and manage that product uh, a lot more effectively if we do it as a crop. Uh, so I think of cattle, uh, cow-calf production the same way that the, the most important um, overall concept that to focus on is to having a very defined calving season. Uh, so that we fertilize everything at the same time, uh, we harvest everything at the same time, we can control nu nutrient delivery uh, much more effectively if we have a controlled uh, breeding and calving season and, and have that as tightly as possible. Uh, so that's the first thing that to really focus on if we want to, to have the ability to do everything else right, that it controls postpartum and estrus uh, with the idea of trying to get as many bred um, back when we need them to in the, the subsequent um, breeding season. So I mentioned that uh, just the sheer number of days postpartum has a, an impact on anestrus. 
Uh, these are uh, this is kind of a meta-analysis uh, put together that, that looks at the number of days postpartum and how many of the, uh, or what percentage those cows are cycling. See in this, um, uh, in this chart that actually uh, it takes quite a, uh, a bit just to get out, quite a bit of time, two months to get out to that 55%. We want to try to push that back uh, way more than, than what they found in, in this research. We look at it a different way and think about uh, having that controlled calving season and, and really even within that controlled calving season, having a very tight calving distribution. Um, I look at it this way. So I could have a 90-day uh, a uh, breeding season that results in a 90% pregnancy rate in several different ways. I could have just steady getting a few pregnant uh, throughout that those 90 days. Uh, I could maybe if I went through a drought or, or some poor nutrition uh, the, the previous uh, year and uh, the cows are, are a little bit slow to come out of that anestrous period. I only have 10% of them early on, uh, but I catch up and I get 90% of them pregnant or I can front load that, uh, that calving distribution, get a lot of them bred very early, uh, right after we start the breeding season, and then uh, wrap up, uh, you know, with the rest of them. And, and really what I like to target more than this 90 day is going to be at least a 60 and, and ideally a 45 day breeding season that results in a 90% uh, percent, uh, um, uh, actually I would say weaning rate is what we're shooting for. So a higher pregnancy rate than that. But if you look at that, those three types of distributions, uh, and the, what that means for the average days postpartum when I start the next breeding season, you can see that, that I can uh, have, on average, my cows further out from that last calving period. Um, and it, it, it's um, really obvious, and, and it, it should go without saying, but when you just see it in numbers, the difference that, that I can make in the, the average days postpartum of my cows when I start that next breeding season are, is extremely important. So how do we do that? What are some things that we can focus on? And here's where I'll uh, eventually get into talking about why I set up uh, the understanding of how that, that system, how the physiology works. Uh, the first thing I'll say before I get into that, though, is just remember that, um, uh, you know, I think there's, um, uh, that in the cattle industry in general, uh, at least um, uh, in, the, in the region in which I, I operate, uh, I think we um, don't, uh, there's some low-hanging fruit, I'll say, to, to be able to use uh, heterosis in, in a more uh, targeted manner uh, or to make a more broad um, use of uh, heterosis. Uh, so it's so a crossbreeding heterosis. Uh, don't have time to go into that, but just realizing that uh, a trait like reproductive performance, which is lowly heritable, so it doesn't pass on like frame size and those kinds of things, does respond very well to crossbreeding, to heterosis. Uh, so let's not forget that if you're a commercial cattleman or if you're a seed stock producer uh, using helping your, your um, bull buyers uh, or, or genetic buyers understand uh, how the heterosis uh, impacts reproductive performance, uh, both are extremely important. So one thing that, that we've done uh, over the last, I'd say, eight to 10 years quite a bit is synchronization investors for natural service. So now we're getting into some specific management that, that helps uh, um, kind of address this deal of getting cows rebreed quickly. Um, and I'll just show these data quick and I'll come back uh, at the end here and, and tell why it's, uh, why it's important. But these are um, some data that uh, Les Anderson at the University of Kentucky primarily did. We, we had some cows run, running in these trials. But um, if you just focus on the bottom uh, part of this chart uh, and looking at control cows that did not receive any kind of um, uh, intervention prior to uh, their breeding season, uh, versus cows that just received a seven-day cedar, no injections, so it, it was just putting a cedar in, a, a cedar-controlled intervaginal drug release device. It releases progesterone uh, while it's inserted uh, for just seven days, and that, that's all it was. Uh, a lot of folks we work with in, in this region <clears throat> have uh, jobs off the farm, so maybe they, did, they put cedars in on a Saturday, took them out the next Saturday, and put the bulls in. Uh, so the we uh, increased the overall pregnancy rate to, to, that, uh, to that breeding season. But the more dramatic thing is that, that we uh, dramatically increased the uh, calving distribution such that 80% of the calves born to those uh, groups that just received a cedar for seven days, nothing else, uh, they 80% um, of those calves came in the first 30 days. And then go back and think about what that does to days postpartum at the next breeding season and controlling that tight calving distribution in a, in a limited uh, breeding and calving season, 
and how much easier it is to control everything else. And then that feeds on itself year over year to make it quite a bit easier to get cows pregnant. Um, these are some data just showing the difference in, uh, in uh, pregnancy uh, rate uh, resulting for, or fertility resulting from breeding cows that would or would not have shown uh, estrus. And um, so this is to, these are pregnancy rates to fixed timed artificial insemination. Uh, so a management practice that we can use with estrus seniorization for AI uh, that results in more cows being bred earlier, even if we had not seen those cows uh, cycle. Uh, and basically that's trying to catch that uh, maybe the, some of these in silent heat or uh, wouldn't have displayed heat as effectively as um, uh, they should. And, and so we can get a lot of cows pregnant by using fixed time, timed AI to, to estrus um, with uh, synchronized estrus uh, and a, a very important, I think, uh, approach to take um, rather than just watching heat if you're using artificial insemination, uh, using something uh, to, to get as many um, cows bred as early as possible. So I, I show um, this slide with all these estrus synchronization protocols on it, not to talk about each of them individually, uh, but to, um, to illustrate that nearly all of them now have a progestogen or a progesterone of some, point, of some sort involved in them, either cedar or the um, oral, orally active progestogen, uh, melangesterol acetate or MGA. Uh, so all of those have some duration of progesterone involved with that. Most of them are seven uh, or 10 or five. Uh, or 14 days exposure to a cedar or to MGA, but the exposure to progesterone very short duration of time. So if you remember back to that discussion of the, the physiology and endocrinology that took some time to, to start this story with, what does that short duration of progesterone look like? Or what does that short duration of just the seven days of a cedar, no injections or anything else prior to natural service uh, breeding season, what does that look like in the cow's physiology? Well, it looks exactly like the short cycle, that low uh, and short duration exposure to progesterone that is so important, like I mentioned, to starting the normal estrus cycles after coming out of that postpartum anestrus. So very clear, um, uh, you know, kind of a story of how we have a technology that mimics what uh, naturally happens in, in the cow's physiology, uh, but we can use that to give us a little hedge to make sure that, uh, you know, if we have everything else right, like uh, the nutrition that Eric will talk about, um, some of these cows, especially first calf heifers, or, or if we have years that are difficult leading into uh, a calving season and worried about rebreeding the next year, we have ways to address that. And understanding a little bit about the cow's physiology and the tools and how those uh, mesh together, I think is very important to making sure we, we make all the right decisions to get these cows bred to have a calf every year and to do them as early as possible in uh, the uh, breeding and calving season. And the last thing I'll leave you with on a long-term or big picture kind of a concept, and, and that's really the way um, I like to step back and think about these things sometimes. If we just cull open cows, if we, and that requires them pregnancy diagnosis at some point, right? But if we determine as quickly as possible the cows that didn't breed to our calving uh, or to our breeding season, and are not going to produce a calf for us and uh, giving them alternative employment as quickly as we can to get them off the feed bill or whatever, you know, stock them, whatever the timing is right. Uh, but just taking them out of the genetic pool, uh, while I said that, that reproduction uh, is not highly heritable, uh, I do say that uh, infertility is terminally heritable, right? So uh, if uh, we do you know, keep that cow a, a year and let her freeload and and then do get her bred the next year, she's going to beget um, uh, some limited fertility genetics, and, and that just builds up on us over time. But if we stay really dedicated, whether it's seed stock or commercial, because remember seed stock, you're selling these good genetics, hopefully, into uh, commercial production. If we really stay true to this, then it answers so many questions. Uh, you know, get the question a lot, what size cow do I need uh, to fit my environment, all those things. If you just cull open cows, the, you'll get to the kind of cows you need uh, for the, the way you manage them. So we, we need to find a sweet spot, you know, between changing our environment, changing the management, changing the genetics. But if we call open cows, it'll help us meet that uh, that sweet spot, find that sweet spot um, more quickly and, and less expensive uh, than other methods of doing so. So with that, Kim, I'll uh, turn it over to, to you and Eric. Thank you, Justin. 
Our next presenter is Eric Bailey, an accomplished professor, cattle rancher, and researcher of ruminant nutrition. Eric holds a PhD from Kansas State University. For his research, he's received over $1.1 million in grants and has 21 publications in peer-reviewed journals. Recently, Eric was selected as a featured speaker at the 2020 National Cattlemen's Beef Association Cattlemen's College. He writes two columns for National Cattle Magazines and leads a weekly town hall meeting series for the University of Missouri Extension, in addition to other extension activities. Eric is also a member of the American Registry of Professional Animal Scientists. Welcome, Eric. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here with us. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to get visit about uh, the nutritional needs of beef cows around calving. Now, I'm guessing all of you have experienced some sticker shock on the farm here recently as we look at the price of, of inputs for our, our beef herds, whether that's fertilizer prices, whether that's feed prices. Um, you know, the calf market is strong right now, but our, we're seeing our cost of inputs rise just as quickly, if not more quickly, than the price of our of our our sales products are. And so, you know, I think the best thing we can do in in a time like this is to really tighten our belt and find out where we can save some money, where where we might be leaking some money out. And the nutritional needs of, of beef cows around calving are are a really great place to focus. Now. Nutrition can be as easy or as complex as you want to make it, and you know the the easiest part about nutrition is that we have a a nutritional status barometer, okay, and by that I mean we need to know whether these cows are are gaining or losing weight now unfortunately, for most farms, it's not as simple as running a cow across the scale once a week, once a month, twice a year. You know, like we might do with a with a body weight scale at home in the bathroom, we have to uh, we have to use or rely on something else to give us an idea of of where our cows are at, and that's where we come into this idea of body condition scoring. Well, extension faculty like Justin and myself have been talking about body condition scoring beef cows for a long time. Typically, what we do with body condition scoring is it's scored on a one to nine scale based on a on a visual appraisal of the animals. Now, I'm going to show you an animal that you have the opportunity to judge as, as thin, adequate, or, or fleshy. This picture that I'm showing here is an example of a cow that's in a body condition score three on a one to nine scale. Okay, Three is inadequate for uh, productivity of of your cow herds and so this this is an example of a score that we would not we would not want to see a, a large number of cows in our herd um, at especially around the time of calving calving body condition score at calving is is a vital measure to the the future reproductive performance of beef cows as justin did such a nice job of of explaining to us Part of the reason that nutrition and, and reproduction are so intertwined around calving is that essentially, if you look at the relationship between body condition score at calving and how long it takes them to get pregnant following or how long they're, they are not cycling following calving, the thinner a cow is, the longer it takes her to get to, to become, to start cycling again after calving. Uh, these data have been around for for 30 years, and we and we've been talking about them. A cow that's on a body in a body condition score of three, like I showed in the picture above, is going to take nearly 90 days to resume cycling, whereas a cow that's in a body condition score of five will take 30 fewer days to to resume cycling. And those 30 days can make or break your um, cow herd profitability, as as Justin was mentioning. Uh, the Calving season distribution is a, is a critical uh, measure of, of cow herd productivity and front loading those calves as early as you can, as many of them as early as you can in the calving season is a, is a great way to um, ensure the productivity of your herd. When we look at the beef cow production cycle, I think there's a very difficult time if we start from the day of calving we have a number of events that all come together at that period of time that 
that can cause reproductive failure. Okay, so if on day zero of cow calves, she's going to reach her peak milk lactation within 60 days post calving. That corresponds with her peak nutrient requirements. She's going to need as many nutrients as she can get to produce milk to support the calf that she's that she's nursing. But at the same time, she's also needing to um, overcome that uterine involution and to resume cyclicity and to prepare herself for the next the next breeding season. For a cow to calve every 365 days, she needs to have or to achieve pregnancy within 85 days after calving. So we've got calving, peak nutrient requirements, or peak lactation and peak nutrient requirements, and the breeding season all occurring in a relatively short and condensed window. Let's look at another body condition score. So this cow is an example of a body condition score five. You'll notice that she appears to be more round. You don't see any ribs. You don't see any um, vertebrae across the top. It looks like she's got some muscle in her in her hind quarters. And she overall, she looks rounder and softer and less angular than that body condition score cow, three cow that you saw a second ago. Now contrast that with this cow. This is a body condition score seven cow. You'll notice how you she has a much more filled out hind end. She's also starting to deposit some some fat around her tail head. Um, definitely even softer and rounder and cooler than that body condition score five. Having a herd full of cows at a body condition score seven that look just like this can be as big of a problem as a body condition score three, but not from a physiological or from a reproductive or nutritional standpoint, but mostly from a from a cost standpoint. If I'm putting, you know, five to six, seven, eight pounds of feed into these cows per day, in addition to putting out hay, in addition to having access to pasture, I'm I'm over supplementing these cows. There's no benefit to having a majority of your herd in a body condition score seven as there is in a body condition score five. And so finding these places where we're unnecessarily feeding cows during times of, you know, economic unrest and substantial feed prices is a, is a great way to sharpen your pencil and maybe improve your bottom line. Now, all of this comes into play in, a, in something I call the nutritional challenge. We make a lot of unforced errors in the beef cattle industry. I'm just going to call it straight. Calving in the winter is foolhardy. I, I am very much opposed to the concept of, of a February calving cow herd. And unless there is a scenario where you're being compensated for winter calving, a la a seed stock operation, some kind of value added. Now, the reason that I feel so strongly about that is this conceptual graph that I've got on the screen here. So the black line is a cow's nutrient requirements. Now I've expressed these, I've deleted the units off of the y-axis, but essentially this is the energy density of the diet. Across the x-axis, we have the months of the year. And then the green line is the energy concentration of uh, a generic cool season grass. The relationship of the two lines is what's vitally important for you to understand here. When the black line is above the green line, it doesn't matter how much of this feed we have available. The cow is not going to meet her nutrient requirements. She's going to come up against gut fill constraints before she will eat, consume enough calories to, to meet her nutrient requirements. And so we have to fill the difference between the black and the green line with a higher energy density supplement. Now, the reason that I'm opposed to winter calving is that we could shift that black line much easier than we can shift the green line. Selecting a calving season get, affords you the opportunity to, to essentially build your cow nutrient curves around your forage system. A, a key concept that I'm going to repeat several times is allow your forage, your pack 
pastures to absorb as much of the nutritional costs of your cow herd as possible and consider that many of the operations that are in place across this country right now are not designed to allow the forage to absorb that nutritional uh, need. So let's let's take it back from the from the science and let's just go to look at a couple of rules of thumb. Okay, so energy is typically expressed in beef cattle diets in a number of different ways. I like to talk TDN or total digestible nutrients because that can be expressed either as a percentage or in terms of pounds. And I've found that folks seem to grasp that concept a little better than going in a um, mega calories of net energy for maintenance or really trying to dial it in. So my rules of thumb for TDN is that if I'm getting a hay test done and on my hay that I'm going to feed the pregnant cows, if it's less than 55% um, TDN, I'm probably going to need to feed some supplement, um, some high energy supplement to these cows if I'm going to maintain body condition. And, and certainly I'm going to need to be above that 55 if I'm going to gain any body condition. Now for a lactating cow, I want the TDN of, their, of her diet to be above 60%. During the spring green up on tall fescue, during the early fall growth, during the stockpiling period, that 60% is easily attainable. The places that we run into challenges of getting there is now when we're feeding fescue hay that was put up in June or even in July. You know, I, I test a lot of this fescue hay that's 50 to 52 TDN. Energy in a cool season perennial forage system is the most limiting nutrient. A lot of folks focus on protein. Um, I find that many fescue hays, even when they are what I would consider bad fescue hay are still going to meet the uh, rules of thumb for crude protein. So a hay that has greater than 8% crude protein is adequate for pregnant cows and one that's greater than 10% is, is adequate for lactating cows. Now, this concern becomes magnified if I'm working in um, the Western part of the United States, if my forage system system is based around warm season forages. So typically you would see prairie haze, um, native warm season grass haze, dormant forage if you're grazing it um, during the winter time will often be four or five percent crude protein. And so out west crude protein becomes very important to supplement on dormant forage. Out east energy is still more important because oftentimes even poor for poor quality fescue poor Poor quality cool season forages are going to have are going to meet these rules of thumb thresholds. So let's work through one quick example. This is a February one calving cow that's being fed hay right now. We know that we're still probably three to five weeks away from being able to turn cows out on pasture. Um, we're we're kind of in the mud season, unfortunately. So this is really a uh, a tough time to be feeding cows right now. But let's say that we've got you know, ample access to 50% uh, TDN fescue hay and 8% crude protein uh, that has 8% crude protein. Now, this cow is 30 days post calving. So she is, her nutrient requirements are near their absolute top. Um, our nutrient requirements for beef cattle textbook says that she's going to eat about 30 pounds of hay per day and that she needs a ration that has at least 55% TDN, 54.55% TDN. To keep this cow from losing weight, she's going to need about 20% of her feed to come from a feed that's mixed with, that's at least 80% TDN to meet the energy requirement. So that would be the equivalent of about six pounds of soy holes per day. Or if it's common in your area to blend corn, gluten, distiller's grain, soy holes to make a commodity mix as it is in Missouri, that's roughly four pounds of that commodity mix. Now, let's go back and assume that that feed costs 15 cents a pound or $15 a hundredweight, $300 a ton. Very common going rate for this type of supplement in Missouri right now. You're looking at 60 to 75 cents per cow per day just in supplement. The take home message from this slide is poor quality hay can end up costing you more money in the long run, cheap 
poor quality hay can cost you more money in the long run than higher quality hay that requires less supplement, especially right now where we're looking at feed prices the way they are. There are far too many people in this country that are putting up hay when it's convenient or when you maximize tonnage rather than any consideration towards quality. If you're cutting fescue hay, you need to be cutting it earlier than you think. And, and you need to be thinking about May rather than June or July. Now, I get that May is also the wettest month of the year, at least for us here in Columbia, Missouri. So finding that window to get dry hay um, swathed, raked, uh, um, dried down, and then baled is a challenge. But you're still looking at a scenario where, you know, I don't see feed prices coming down anytime soon. You know, we're we're looking at if we're we're putting poor quality hay up and we're winter calving cows, then we we are backing ourselves into a corner to maintain reproductive success of having to feed these cows some of these expensive supplements. Which really brings me to my my key points for today. So Poor quality hay is going to force our hand in terms of expensive supplementation programs. The consequence of not participating in an expensive supplementation program is losing body condition between calving and breeding. And losing body condition between calving and breeding is going to result in poor pregnancy rates because it's going to take longer for a cow to begin cycling again. The best thing that we can do is to reconsider our calving season to allow our grazed forage to absorb as much of the nutritional debts, the nutritional needs from a beef cow as possible, and, and try to create systems where you're feeding as little purchased and raised feed, so that, that's both hay and supplement, so that the cow is doing as much of the work and you're avoiding some of these expensive feedstuffs. That's all I've got for today. Here's my contact info. I uh, thank you for your time and appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Eric. So I have a few questions for the two of you. Uh, and I want to start with Justin. I think Eric covered some of this in his presentation as well. Uh, but can producers do anything nutritionally to support better reproduction? What would be the key things that you would recommend? Yes, yeah, certainly. Just to reiterate uh, some of the, the big points that, that Eric made, uh, you know, maintaining body condition, um, you know, I think of a few things, too, that, that uh, you know, again, I'll just reiterate from uh, what uh, Eric mentioned is that on body condition, you know, it's a snapshot. Uh, it's a, a one-time evaluation, uh, and I would encourage folks to, to keep an eye on that, do it repeatedly, uh, and just kind of a a rule of thumb that, that I have uh, based, of course, on, on research and, and the science behind it, but I would actually rather have a, a body condition a, a little bit too low, but increasing on an increasing plan of nutrition than I would a, a really ideal body condition um, that's actually losing condition going into the uh, breeding season. So just some uh, nuances like that. The other things too, mineral nutrition, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, making sure that they stay constant on on their uh, mineral needs tailored to the environment that they're in and and the deficiencies that the, they might not uh, be receiving everything uh, specific uh, minerals that they need from uh, their environment and and just remembering that you know it's perceived by the cow as their cue uh, to know whether or not they need to be fertile again to be able to support a, an, another lactation. Now, Eric. Uh, how can producers know if their pastures are ready to provide the nutrition that's needed to support the cow-calf pairs? You know, you talked a lot about hay quality and especially with high feed costs right now. What are some things to look for in our pastures? So, Kim, the producer, the average producer generally sees the first blade of green grass as the key to or the cue to, to turn out. And that's that's a mistake. Because an early graze on young vegetative forage can actually stunt and limit the productivity over the entire season. I typically, what I encourage folks to do is to delay turnout later than, than they think. I think that we ought to allow forages to be at least six, seven inches tall before we turn out onto them. We allow that grass to develop a full complement of leaves. We allow it to restore um, root carbohydrates that it lost basically coming out of dormancy 
and and that just makes a more productive and healthier forage system in the long run. So don't turn out at the first sight of green grass. Let it develop a full complement of leaves. Let it get to be six inches tall. Wait two weeks longer than you would like to turn out. And I suspect that you're going to end up with more forage in your system grown than you would expect. Now a question for both of you. Are the repro or nutrition needs of late calving or difficult calving cows any different than the other cows? So I'll take a, a run at that first. Um, so the late calving cows, you know, sometimes they'll be late calving because they, they have, uh, you know, uh, increased nutritional needs. Uh, maybe it's from, you know, two years ago that they never really got caught up and we're just trying to, to, to get them in a better position over time. Um, you know, I think from a, an applied reproductive technology standpoint, they definitely uh, have additional needs if we expect to keep them uh, in the the herd in that calving season to, um, you know, the, be a little bit late one year, later the next year, and then eventually not conceive at all uh, in the breeding season. So to, to keep that from happening, uh, it really goes all the way back to the heifer development and having them calve early the first time and in good condition, it sets us up to i be in a better position uh, going forward uh, beyond that. But, uh, you know, the things like um, using, if it's just for natural service and uh, still using some uh, light synchronization for that natural service, uh, we average, you know, moving late calving cows up as much as 30 days or on average 30 days uh, earlier than the than calving the, the previous year. Um, so those kinds of things, I think, would be the extra uh, attention that they would need. So I tend to focus more on young first calf heifers, and I tend to focus on situations where we have a year-round um, breeding season in, for questions like this. One, if you have a handful of heifers in with older cows, they're likely at the bottom of the pecking order. And are especially if you're feeding supplement, you know, it's, it's likely that the older, more dominant cows are going to push them out of the way. The best thing you can do with a an animal that's a special class like that is to separate them off whenever possible, especially as you're supplementing and feeding them. The second piece of this is that if you have a or lack a defined breeding season, you've got bulls turned out year round, you literally have cows that are in all four stages of the annual production cycle at one time. And so you've got, you know, a cow at peak black patient next to a second trimester uh, pregnant cow that's weaned a calf. And those two nutrient uh, requirement profiles are drastically different from one another. So in a case like that, who do you feed to? Do you feed to the, the pregnant cow's nutrient needs and rob the lactating cow of, of needed requirement or needed nutrients before the breeding season hurting conception? No. Most producers, what they do is they feed the peak nutrient requirements across the herd all the time. And so then your pregnant cows are town dog fat and you're over supplementing. And especially now in the current economic climate, that's, that is a, that is an expensive, expensive prospect. And so, you know, those are the, those are the two scenarios that I think about in, in terms of your question. So as we wrap up today, with all the changes going on in the herd over the next uh, few weeks and months, what would you say are the top three things producers need, need to make sure they focus on from this repro and nutritional standpoint? Why don't we start with you, Justin? Sure, and I'll, I'll just uh, piggyback right off of what Eric said, um, having a, a defined breeding and calving season, it just makes everything, It's I call it the gateway to, to doing everything else right. It's the gateway to all other management practices being performed uh, effectively. Um, so first and foremost, uh, I think that that's, you know, the the, the uh, place to focus. Um, you know, pregnancy diagnosis from a sheer reproductive technology standpoint is um, always important. It's important uh, to, in, in times of uh, really um, dramatically high input costs, uh, to make sure that everything that you are uh, sinking that money into is going to at least give you something to uh, some sort of revenue uh, from that uh, investment. So 
uh, from sheer reproduction, those are the two things that, that, that I always would focus on. If you don't have those in place as a producer now, um, it, it's not too late to do it now. You know, don't don't think about well, everything's already expensive anyway. I'll just wait till it's less expensive to implement these other things. And, and I would just do it now. If you don't have a defined calving season, start working on that now. And if you're not pregnant, doing pregnancy diagnosis, go ahead and, and uh, work on that now and, and have it in place. Um, for the good times, it'll be extra, uh, you know, impactful and, and you'll be able to generate uh, the optimum revenue that you can from your cow herd. Uh, and then when we get into other times again that, that are difficult, uh, then it'll be much easier to, to survive those times. Eric? So I would encourage producers to take a step back and objectively evaluate your system. Many folks are doing things the way that things have always been done. They're doing things based on tradition, based on their past experiences, based on, you know, what they're hearing from their neighbors or, or relatives who have been in the business. But it, it's really time to start asking some hard questions about why we do things the way we do. Justin pointed out an excellent example of defining a, a breeding season and, and trying to move towards, you know, more uniform management of, of breeding. I'll point out another one. The more steel and fuel you put between the sun and a cow's mouth, the less profitable you'll be. Kit Farrow said that a long time ago, and that is a guiding principle for me, meaning that the more hay that I put up, the more hay that I feed the beef cows, the more supplement that I put out, the less profitable my cow herd is going to be. And so that requires some really difficult questions and some thoughtful examination. Calving in the winter makes no sense to me. It never has. It never will. Feeding hay makes very little sense to me. Now, I understand more so now that I live in an area of 42-inch annual precipitation back versus from when I used to live in New Mexico when we got 14 inches of annual precipitation. Totally different systems. Getting away from hay is probably not likely in the east of the Mississippi, but waging war on costs and reducing the number of days that you feed hay and supplement will unlock so many good things for the beef cow herd. Well said, so many things to consider. My thanks for joining us and sharing their invaluable expertise and experience. Don't forget to subscribe to the Bova News channel on YouTube, find our Bova News podcasts on your favorite listening platform, or find more information at bovanews.com. Thanks for tuning in with us today. We'll see you next time on another edition of Bova News.